Jason. Thank you very much, Danelle. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Well, it's an honor to be with everyone today. Thank you for taking your time to learn about this really important topic. Um, we really see this uh, particular medicine uh, as a, a mediator of social justice um, because of uh, the really novel role that it plays in oral health care uh, to stabilize uh, the most common disease, you know, dental caries. Um, just like any medicine, it's not, not perfect, uh, and this medicine happens to have extraordinary uh, abilities um, when it works. And so I hope to show you very briefly uh, how it works, at least to our best understanding, kind of what it does, and um, and what we have learned about how to use it. So uh, with that, there we go. So what is it? Uh, if you haven't heard, silver diamine fluoride is silver. The uh, diamine, it means ammonia, basically, uh, and fluoride. Those are the percentages. Uh, and when we first started looking into this, we simplified things to say that the silver, uh, this is all in water, by the way, silver, ammonia, and fluoride in water. Uh, the silver is the antimicrobial, the ammonia keeps the silver and fluoride stable in solution, uh, and the fluoride, uh, as we know, remineralizes. Um, but this is an oversimplification because the silver, the ammonia, and the fluoride all kill bacteria on contact, and the silver and the fluoride both incorporate into the tooth structure. Uh, the fluoride, as we know, creates fluoroapatite, but the silver actually creates these silver protein conjugates for any protein that's exposed, and then it creates these solid silver structures um, that, that reinforce the, the weakened part of the teeth. So they all kind of uh, help control the bacteria. Oh, and then lastly, of course, uh, when the bacteria do overcome the fluoride and silver that are in the teeth and, and demineralize after demineralize the fluoroapatite and remove the silver, then, then those uh, ions go back to help control the bacteria themselves. So it's sort of this uh, multiple effect of the silver and fluoride in particular of killing bugs on contact, strengthening the tooth while they're there, and then if they're released from the teeth, it helps to control the bacteria uh, later, which tells us we have to reapply it uh, over time. Um, and so what does it do? Uh, this, this liquid arrests dental caries, which is a term that used to be in the dental textbooks. Um, it certainly is in the original wonderful textbook of G.V. Black uh, from 1908, the um, pathology of the heart tissues of the teeth. Uh, and I certainly did not learn it in dental school, um, but it means to stop a cavity. Um, it also prevents cavities, both directly, like a fluoride varnish would do if you apply it to a surface that helps prevent any new lesions on that surface, and indirectly, which is a term I've been using to describe the effect of when you put silver fluoride on a caries lesion, that actually reduces the odds of that patient getting another cavity on untreated surfaces. And this particular aspect is what has gotten me so interested in silver fluoride, because it's the best evidence I've seen that we're actually using this to control disease. So by putting the silver fluoride on a cavity, you decrease the chances of that patient getting more cavities, uh, which I wish were true for restorations, but it's basically not. So, um, or at least there's no evidence of that. So it decreases hypersensitivity. So same as fluoride varnish, this is cleared by the FDA to treat sensitive dentin exposures, um, like root exposures, and uh, it turns <laughs> any porous areas of the teeth, any demineralized areas or hypomineralized areas turn black. So this really stains any affected areas, whether it's uh, from hypomen or demen, um, they will, that area, those areas will stain black. And that is really uh, the one side effect. The other is that this stuff doesn't taste very good. So you really have to manage taste and expectation around that. Um, I think perhaps the most important two quotes about this material were just published by, by the American Dental Association Council on Scientific Affairs uh, very publicly in October, um, stating that clinicians are encouraged to prioritize use of non-restorative treatments based on effectiveness, safety, and feasibility. And I believe before this paper was published, that term non-restorative treatment did not exist. Um, so they kind of, I believe, created this term to um, help everyone understand that you don't need to put it a filling 
to treat a cavity. Uh, that's a new idea. And for the American Dental Association to say that clinicians are encouraged based on effectiveness, safety, and feasibility is a big deal because they're not saying dentists. So to open up to Margaret later, of course, um, this means that uh, other folks besides dentists can be involved in the treatment of cavities, really kind of for the first time. Um, and then in another paper published in parallel, uh, they specifically focused on silver fluoride. They said that if you place this twice a year, it's effective for arresting advanced cavitated carious lesions, holes in teeth on any coronal surface with moderate to high certainty. There are exceedingly few things that we have moderate to high certainty of uh, evidence. Um, and so it, this is, this is, they're not saying we need more studies. They're saying that this can stop cavities, period. And so for the ADA to come out and say that to the world um, is really a sign that this is standard of care. This is common. This is uh, what we should all have as an option for managing cavities in any patient. Uh, it is an option just like any other option we've been offering. Um, how does this stuff work? So this is my favorite slide of um, a slice of dentin on, the, on, the, on your left. Uh, there's a slice of dentin that was soaked in strep mutans and sugar for a week, and all of the green is the living strep mutans that has penetrated down into the dentinal tubules. Uh, that's about 150 microns. You can see bacteria go down and start creating microcavitations and all of that. And if you take that same slice of dentin, take it out of the strep mutan soup, rinse it a little bit, put some silver fluoride on there, wait a minute, rinse it a little bit, and then throw it back in the strep mutan soup for an entire extra week. This is what it looks like on the right. The red is dead, the green is alive. So what you can see is that yellow is a mix of living and dead that's coming in back from the top. And so what this shows is that the silver fluoride penetrates deep into the dentin to kill the bacteria. The bacteria stay dead despite exposure to more sugar. And then the bacteria start penetrating in back from the top. So eventually the bacteria can overwhelm the silver that's in the dentin and the fluoride. Um, but 24 hours a day with sugar and strep mutans, uh, that's as far as they go. So it actually makes the tooth more resistant to bacterial invasion uh, than a freshly cut piece of dentin. And so this tells us a lot about how it works and that eventually we need to reapply this stuff and so on. Um, and so I've performed uh, extensive microbiome analysis it's actually metagenomic um, sequencing or metatranscriptomic sequencing. So this is, if you've heard of microbiome research, that was a, a, a major advancement from uh, culture-based techniques where you use Petri dishes. And so uh, in the lab that I've been in for the last six years, we've really pioneered uh, going the next step further, a major step further to look at what all of the genes that are being expressed and really being able to uh, identify species instead of genus, lots of fancy work there, um, a lot of effort, but we've done this with cavities before and after silver fluoride and in a placebo-controlled, randomized controlled trial. Um, in, in, and actually, we've done studies in three different continents now uh, looking at, at this, really trying to look for changes in the microbial profile in, in the relative amount of bacteria that are in there, the, the, the uh, population of bacteria. Um, because we expected to see a very dramatic shift. We assumed that strep mutans was going to disappear uh, and all the other cariogenic bacteria. Um, and what we found was that there were no relative uh, decreases in bacteria, which was really shocking. So what we saw is that all of the bacteria decreased kind of equally. Uh, so the way I like to think about this is like a stereo equalizer. Uh, um, yeah, um, you know, when you have on your stereo, it shows where the lows and the highs and the mids are, and you just turn the volume down and everything quiets down similarly. So certainly there's much, much, much less bacteria. But what we did, the, what we, the reason we did this is what we were concerned about safety. If you take penicillin and you monitor your microbiome, you lose the bad bacteria, but you also lose a lot of the good bacteria, and that can have uh, side effects of discomfort, and it can also have side effects uh, that are, that are life-threatening. And so we really took a deep dive into this, multiple studies, and we found consistently no, no, no patterns of bacteria being lost. So there's no bacteria that are dramatically more susceptible to silver fluoride than others, which is actually surprisingly reassuring. The one bacteria that we see standing out as increasing, um, coincidentally, or perhaps not, 
happens to be the single hope for a probiotic against dental caries. So there's actually three clinical trials, the only clinical trials that I know of that are going on right now of a probiotic bacteria that's placed in yogurt or milk against dental caries for preventing dental caries is the one bacteria that's enhanced when silver fluoride uh, is placed in a cavity and it successfully stops. So that's um, the microbiome work. And then we also looked at antimicrobial resistance genes. It turns out that all of the plasmids, gene cassettes, whatever you want to call it, the vectors that the bacteria use to share their um, resistance to antimicrobials, to penicillin and so on, that they can transfer between each other, those all have anti-metal resistance genes as well. And so we were concerned that we might be selecting for a bunch of superbugs by putting silver fluoride on there. Um, and there were no, again, there were no consistent shifts uh, of these plasmids, which is very reassuring to safety. And so overall, it just seems to be an equal opportunity killer of calming down the bacteria. No dangerous effects on the microbiome. Um, the other thing that we found is by doing uh, high resolution um, microstructural analysis, basically uh, uh, like a cone beam CT, but uh, microscopic, we found that teeth that are treated with silver fluoride, the, the caries, the, the soft, mushy cavity area, uh, compresses down to a very thin layer. That's kind of that, that scab on the top that you see, this runway uh, magic carpet, it kind of looks like, of a very dense layer, and that's a lot of silver and dead bacteria and dentin protein. Um, and that underneath there, that layer is reinforced by basically something that looks like rebar, um, and it, it's these solid silver microwires that are cast into the dentinal tubules and fill in the microvoids caused by the cavity process, um, like I mentioned earlier. So we believe that this is what causes the tooth to actually become harder um, uh, than, it was, than, than freshly cut dentin. So silver diamine fluoride treated caries actually becomes twice as hard as freshly cut dentin, which tells us that we don't need to remove it uh, if we're placing a restoration. Really, you would just focus on cleaning your margins and getting clean enamel margins and a little bit past the DEJ, uh, but leaving this uh, in place as, as a, a perfect foundation for, for your restoration if you decide to place one. Uh, so how do you use this stuff? So assuming that you're using this to treat a cavity and not place a restoration that day, you basically dry, apply, and say bye. Uh, so the advanced technique uh, is basically that you would uh, see a lesion, isolate with cotton, uh, you air dry if you can, we have totally done studies where you just use cotton to dry and it still works. Seems to work a little bit better when you actually use compressed air. Uh, you apply with a micro brush. Um, we wait a little bit of time and, um, you know, five seconds or so. And then most of us put fluoride varnish on over that or Vaseline or something to protect uh, the reaction of the medicine with the lesion uh, for at least a minute uh, so that you're not diluting it with the saliva. Initially, we said that you um, should rinse, uh, but that was because we did not have safety studies in children without a rinse, and that was five years ago. And so now we've done two uh, safety studies in children with a, without a rinse, and everybody's good. Um, and so there's a question about whether it becomes uh, it does become harder. Is it also more brittle? So um, thankfully, the same process that rebar does in cement, um, it actually increases your tensile strength in that area. So thankfully, it's not more brittle in that area. Um, kind of shockingly. Uh, the other things that we do, a lot of times we will place um, chapstick, or I just use Vaseline, not only on the lips, but all around the cheeks uh, to prevent stain on the skin. Um, so really, you just want to protect the reaction for a minute. So, there, so I like to joke with kids uh, that, you know, you can't eat or drink for a minute. So they just watch the clock for a minute, and then they can go. Uh, have a little bit of water, and try to discourage them from swishing. Um, and you expect that the lesion is going to turn jet black and turn as hard, as I said, at least as hard as freshly cut dentin. Um, and so this is the big question where we really have tried to look between the lines of the clinical trial data. So we have qu high quality evidence uh, that twice a year is better than once a year uh, for caries arrest. And so this is what I've tried to put together, looking across the clinical trials and across the experience of folks who have been using this for 15 years, 40 years in other countries and even in the United States. Um, and so for what I would call mild caries, where, for example, none of the lesions are actually cavitated, 
uh, maybe they're just radiographic and into the first third of the dentin, um, we just put this on twice a year. So at their normal recare visits. Um, and for more moderate caries where maybe there's lesions all over the mouth, uh, you have smooth surface lesions, you have cavitations, et cetera, um, we add a loading dose, uh, just another application uh, earlier on. Um, and then we slow down to the every six months. Uh, and then for severe caries, we add maybe two loading doses and then an extra visit at three months. So we're, the point is that we're stacking the extra visits at the beginning of the therapy, just as you would if someone had a raging cellulitis, uh, you might tell them to take a double dose of the antibiotics you're giving, or you might say, let's put you on IV antibiotics right now to increase the amount of medicine in their bloodstream uh, to reach a steady state. And then what's really important also is that you maintain that steady state uh, over time. So we have seen a perfect analogy to silver fluoride therapy in that uh, for patients who have raging caries, uh, it takes more doses uh, earlier on to reach a steady state of silver fluoride in their lesions and stabilizing those lesions, and then that maintenance doses can decrease in frequency thereafter. Um, so I'm going to show you where I got this from over the next few slides. Uh, these are seven clinical trials, uh, large clinical trials. You can see the numbers of patients. That's 370, 180, 840, 300, 300, 620, 320. These are large uh, carry clinical trials in children. Uh, as I'll show it later, there's clinical trials in older adults as well. Uh, looking out on the horizontal axis is years, one year, two years, three years. And these are percents of caries arrest, meaning that if someone uh, came in with five caries lesions and you treated all five of these cavitated caries lesions and all of them arrested in all the patients, you would have the bar going all the way up to the top 100%. Um, and that is not what we see in any of these, but we do see an effect. We see that the bars are going up in most of them. So reading between the lines on these um, on these clinical trials, uh, this study looked directly at uh, silver fluoride once a year with or without excavating. So are you going to excavate like you would for atraumatic restorative treatment or ITR, IRT, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, for atraumatic restorative, restorative treatment, you, you excavate the soft caries, the, the infected dentin, and then instead here they applied silver fluoride. Uh, and after two and a half years, there was no benefit in terms of arresting more caries lesions. And so there's no reason to do that. Um, with these studies, we look at the frequency of application. So this is where you see the red is twice per year, the black is once per year, and the twice per year is more effective than the once per year consistently in these two trials. It's not an enormous increase in effectiveness, um, but it's enough that you're going to see a difference um, if you're doing this regularly uh, because 70% versus 80% or 80% versus 90%, that extra 10% adds up very quickly when you're applying this to patients that have lots of lesions. Um, and this study down here really at the bottom really did something very important in that it, uh, they placed it once and they got the effect that you would expect at six months and then they never placed it again um, and the cavities started back up again with time. So this tells us to keep applying. Uh, there's a study here where they actually used a 9% SDF. They thought they were using a 30%, but long story. Um, and so the bars are all a lot smaller. The gray is three times in two weeks. Uh, sorry, the brown is three times in two weeks, and the gray is just once a year. And so what's provocative is that initially the three times in two weeks looks like it, it, it worked better. It stopped more cavities short term. But if you never apply it again, uh, some of those, you know, the fewer cavities are going to arrest with time. And if you keep applying just once a year, once a year, uh, you get increased effectiveness. So this is, you know, one of the studies that shows us that we get a benefit from applying it uh, more times. Uh, short-term and long-term. And this is where they compared uh, to atraumatic restorative treatment, just scoop and fill glass ionomer uh, once a year or once, the same as the silver fluoride. And what you can see is that the bars are about the same, the green versus the black, and then down below the green versus the gray, uh, the 30% SPF actually did outperform scoop and fill glass ionomers. Uh, and so our work clinically and in our teaching um, has really explored combining silver fluoride and glass ionomer, and we call that uh, smart filling, silver modified atraumatic restorative treatment. And there is a clinical trial uh, that has undergone, that has uh, that is underway now, uh, which we'll get results on in about a year. 
to see if we get uh, significant increases in effectiveness. And so distilling all of that, uh, what we see is that at six months uh, after initiating silver fluoride therapy, uh, overall you would expect to see that about 45% of lesions appear arrested. Uh, and that no matter how frequently you apply silver fluoride, somewhere around 20% of these lesions will, keep, will, will continue growing despite silver fluoride therapy. And my hypothesis is that you see that at six months. And the difference is between the growing lesions and the lesions that have not grown but still look active. So I do not have a photographic memory, um, but what I, it's pretty obvious to me to see that lesions are actively growing in size at the periphery or in depth uh, versus that it's still, the lesions still look a little bit active. They're not black all throughout. And so that 35% that are not growing but are not black all throughout, are not hard all throughout, um, the data and our experience show that if you just keep applying silver fluoride, uh, those will arrest with time, uh, whereas the ones that are growing by six months, either radiographically or through clinical impression, uh, those need a different therapy. They will keep growing despite continued applications. Um, and that bears out in these clinical trials where you see um, at six months, it's around 45%. But at 18 months, it's more around 80, 90 percent. It kind of plateaus after that. Um, in terms of the likelihood of caries arrest, uh, those studies were all done in cavitated lesions. Um, but uh, Dr. Graham Craig, who's been doing this for over 40 years, published um, papers and a book uh, years ago. The book was just five years ago. The paper was like 25 years ago. Uh, on his experience uh, doing this in a large population, and monitoring uh, outcomes for which teeth really needed uh, restorations, for example, scoop and fill glass anemer. And so the, the greatest flow through of saliva, the most cleansable lesions are the most likely to arrest. Similarly, you wanna think about the size of your contact point and the smallest contact point, if you're looking at an interproximal lesion or a proximal lesion in an interproximal space, um, is the most likely to arrest. And if you have a big flat space in between, the, the saliva is not gonna flow through there uh, the patient's not going to be able to clean the area. Food's going to get stuck there. That's the least likely uh, to stop with silver fluoride therapy. Um, and so that's uh, certainly a reason you can open up these lesions, like with disking. G.V. Black was doing that and teaching it in 1908. Uh, we do that today, or you can put in a restoration or whatever you like. Uh, there are lots of studies on caries prevention with silver fluoride. So that would be placing silver fluoride on high caries risk patients who do not yet have lesions or you're treating the lesions uh, with whatever way and you're using this on, on sound tooth surfaces to try to prevent caries. And um, uh, very consistently over all these clinical trials, you get about a 60% uh, prevented fraction, meaning that you get uh, three less lesions uh, for every five new lesions that an untreated patient would get. So silver fluoride once per year gets a 60% prevented fraction uh, as compared to fluoride varnish four times a year gets a 37% prevented fraction. So this is powerful stuff. Um, and just very briefly, there are also um, caries arrest and caries prevention trials in elders. Um, we go over this, these details more in our uh, YouTube video. We don't have time for this, but just that there is evidence and the more protective factors, the healthier the patients are, uh, the better uh, the outcomes are. Uh, we have a consent form as Word documents at this site. We have it in English, Cantonese, Mandarin, Arabic, and Spanish. Uh, you can edit it however you like. Uh, this is a documentation of consent, of course. A piece of paper is not a informed consent. The informed consent is your conversation. We highly recommend to um, support your conversation with pictures of before and after so that patients can see uh, what it looks like, and anyone is welcome to use these for any purpose uh, and edit as you'd like. Uh, so take-homes, uh, just simplifying, um, silver fluoride arrests 81% uh, of caries lesions, cavitated uh, caries lesions when used uh, once or more per year. It prevents around 60% of new lesions in terms of prevented fraction. Uh, drying before use increases the amount of silver fluoride that can absorb into the lesion. Um, it appears to be extremely safe uh, and well tolerated. The main uh, side effect is really that it stains the crap out of everything. Uh, so if you get it on the skin, you get a henna tattoo. The big trick for removing skin stains is hydrogen peroxide. 
Um, Jeanette McLean has a, a long list of things that you can do to get it out of countertops, uh, but basically Mr. Clean Magic Eraser that works wonders uh, to get it off the skin, but basically hydrogen peroxide is your go-to. Um, and like I said, she was the one who taught me to just, instead of risking the chance that the kid would end up with a um, uh, uh, silver fluoride induced beard, <laughs> uh, give them a Vaseline beard ahead of time um, and then wipe it off afterwards. Um, and so the, just briefly, there was a um, question about, I think I have like a minute or two more. There was a question about the depth of penetration and I'm gonna go back to that slide uh, and that's here. So these micro wires and the solids that they um, create, we have seen those go as far down as two millimeters um, in clinically treated teeth that were extracted at least a year later uh, for orthodontic purposes or exfoliated uh, because they were primary teeth. Um, so we've seen at least, uh, at least two millimeters where there are solid silvers down um, into the teeth. And um, ex vivo, um, you can stain, sorry, you can get, uh, yeah, stain or silver fluoride uh, remnants as far down as a caries lesion goes and even beyond that. Really, if the dentinal tubule is, is open, the silver will penetrate down um, uh, depending on how much you add and how dry the area is. So the drier the area, the further it absorbs. Um, what we see is that um, root caries uh, are a little slower um, to absorb. So you want to take your time with root caries, especially slow-growing root caries. Fast-growing root caries in a patient that um, you know just started chemotherapy, radiation, uh, and suddenly their saliva is not working and the caries are going out of control, those lesions tend to absorb all the way down to the bottom and past. Um, if you have a patient who has had ongoing root caries slowly growing for years and years and years, those ones it's hard to penetrate all the way down to the bottom of the lesion. Um, and so just real quickly for caries prevention, um, uh, is there a risk of staining newly erupted teeth? Yeah, if you have significant hypomineralization, um, you can stain. Uh, we don't really see it very commonly. Usually if we have uh, bad hygiene and early enamel um, demineralization, that can stain. I have yet to see a newly erupted tooth stain, but hypothetically that could happen. Uh, for caries prevention, what great question, is it applied locally or all over the mouth? Uh, what we do is we target the highest risk areas. For example, if I see a three-year-old and a five-year-old siblings that are both missing teeth D through G, the upper incisors, um, because of caries, and then their one-year-old sibling is with me and there's no signs of caries yet, I am going to apply a silver fluoride onto those teeth. If a teenager walks in with a two liter of Mountain Dew or worse, uh, I am going to put this in the interproximal spaces, um, dry and apply in the interproximal. Uh, so we don't highly, re we don't recommend putting it all over the mouth uh, just because it can be a lot of medicine that tastes not so great. Um, the more you put on, the more risk you have of, of annoying the gingiva. Uh, would acid etch help to uh, the depth of absorption? Formal studies have not been done, but people are doing that and getting good results. Um, what was the next question? Uh, there's, a, there's a product that claims to not stain. Um, this is a picture before and after two lesions of a, of a person who used that product uh, before and after. And as you can see at the bottom, obviously there's no stain. I'm just kidding. Um, so I just talked to the um, head of sales um, for North America for SDI. Uh, at the ADA meeting, and she said very specifically what the inventor of this um, uh, said is that uh, Riva Star should be used under rubber dam isolation or with a proper gingival barrier underneath a glass ionomer restoration, underneath a pure glass ionomer restoration, and that what it will prevent is the restoration itself and its margins from staining. Uh, that is their claim. And you can see that if you're using it as just a treatment for caries, um, that's what's going to happen. Also, it is pH 13, and so this can be very caustic. So that's why you really need a rubber dam or a gingival barrier uh, to be placing Revastar. Uh, and I assume there's going to be other products on the market that are just in pH 10 